So I'm really excited to, uh, uh, to introduce Nick Barnes, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Um, Nick, uh, it was very interesting. I happened to have been on the committee that was uh, choosing the postdocs uh, two or three years ago. And I always am looking for the Brazilian person who works on Brazil and, you know, trying to ease that person through the committee. But with Nick's case, I had to, I didn't say anything. I was silent because when his application came through, everyone unanimously agreed that he was ranked at the top. And so I could just uh, be pleasantly happy to see that we were able to get such a talented scholar. He received his PhD in political science at the University of Wisconsin Math Madison. And he was born and raised in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, where he attended Coe College. He then received a master's in uh, science from University uh, Co College in Dublin in nationalism and ethno-communal conflict, and spent a year in Israel as a Rotary ambassadorial scholar. I just, I'm learning this now about him. I didn't know these things. It's, have things to talk to him about besides Brazil. His research has been funded by the Harry, uh, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, the National Science Foundation, the Social Science Research Council's Drug Security and Democracy in Latin America, and the International Dissertation Research Fellowship, as well as the Department of Education through the Fulbright Hayes Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad. And today, uh, Nick is going to be talking about monopolies of violence, gang governance in Rio de Janeiro. And it's, this is also kind of a mock job talk. So we can ask really hard questions afterward to put them against the wall. No interruptions during the job talk, but afterward we can just kind of really challenge him to give those incisive answers so he can get a job. So with all, with no further ado, let's give a round of applause to, uh, to Nick. And as always, we want to thank uh, Ramon Stern for helping organize this event. Thank you, Jim, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you, Ramon, for helping organizing the event. Um, so I think I'm just going to jump right in. I wanted to start with this photo because I think it pretty accurately captures the popular understanding of drug trafficking gangs in Rio de Janeiro. They're understood as purely violent organizations that coerce impoverished favela communities to ensure their access to illicit markets. But not every gang looks like this. Some gangs in Rio look a lot more like this. And that is, this is a Baile Funk. This is a huge street party that a gang organized for a local community in which they hired a very popular DJ, put on a light and fireworks show, uh, and organized alcohol and food vendors. Uh, this is one of the only free forms of entertainment that's provided to favela communities. There's, there's generally no other free forms of recreation for young people. So this is an important sort of benefit that the local community gets from the gang itself. But this is just the most visible form of benefit that, that the community gets from the gang. The gang also provides or implements effective systems of law and justice. They offer dispute resol resolution to residents. And they even provide certain forms of welfare. So this sort of huge disparity in how we can understand gangs led me to ask a series of questions about how gangs relate to local communities. Right? And the first is, why do some gangs look like that first photo? Why are they so coercive in certain cases? Um, and the second is, why do some gangs provide lots of different benefits to communities, right? Why do we get these different types of gangs, some that rely on much more violence, others that provide lots of effective local institutions and benefits to local residents? And can we get both at the same time? Can you have a co very coercive gang while simultaneously trying to provide goods and services to local favela residents. And the last question that I want to ask in this talk is that why do gangs change their behavior over, over time? Some gangs may look like that first picture of the coercive gang, but over time develop institutions or relationships with the local community where they're really providing benefits to them. Other gangs may start by throwing parties, they may start by resolving disputes between residents, but over time become much more coercive. So these are the types of questions that I'm going to be asking uh, and answering in this talk. And I think this is a really important question, not just for Rio de Janeiro, not just for Brazil, but for really all of Latin America. This is a, this is a map of criminal governance in Latin America. There's over 30 million residents 
within Latin America who are essentially living under the authority of different types of criminal organizations. Those could be drug trafficking organizations, they could be cartels, they could be prison gangs, they could be street gangs, they could be militias, paramilitaries. So these 30 million people are generally the most marginalized and impoverished that live within the region. Um, and they bear the brunt of the, the extremely high levels of violence within the region, both by the criminal organizations themselves, but as well as from the state. And so it's, I think it's essential to try to understand how these criminal groups, gangs, uh, relate to these local communities and provide them certain goods or use violence against them. I think it's also important to understand these relationships because without understanding the microdynamics of how these relationships play out, it's almost impossible to c combat these organizations. They rely on these communities very heavily to hide, to, to, to avoid state enforcement. And so uh, if we're going to effectively reduce violence within the region, which accounts for about a, a third of all violent deaths throughout the world, even though Latin America accounts for only about 8% of the world's population, we really need to understand how these organizations function within these spaces. Now, there's a, a very large and growing literature on this within Rio de Janeiro as well as across the region. Um, and there's a few existing explanations, even though most scholars generally just focus on the violent aspects of these criminal groups. Uh, there's a few scholars who have focused on how they relate to local populations. So there's one explanation that says, really, it's, it's just the idiosyncratic tendencies of the leader of these groups, right? Sometimes you get a good gang leader, and other times you get a ga bad gang leader. That good gang leader is going to use less violence. He's going to provide more benefits to the community. The bad gang leader is going to do the opposite. He's going to use more violence and not provide anything to the community. So that's one explanation. Another are these illicit connections that exist between gangs and the state. So generally gangs develop a relationship with the police through corruption or bribery. They, they can do so in certain cases with political parties or politicians. And as Desmond Arias has very effectively argued in several of his books, it's these relationships with the state from the criminal group itself that dictates how they relate to local populations, whether or not they, they can actually provide goods to them. The final explanation is it really depends on the profitability of the drug trade. If you have a very rich gang or a very rich criminal group, they're going to be able to provide more goods and services to that local community. It's a very, very simple argument. But what I found after living in Rio de Janeiro for three years uh, was actually something quite different. Um, sorry. Um, and I, I first want to argue that I think we need to understand better the worlds in which these criminals actually reside. So, Overall, these criminal groups and the members of these organizations exist within anarchic environments, right? They, they are territorially dependent. They cannot rely on the state to provide protection because they operate in illegal markets, and many of their members are heavily criminalized, generally young, marginalized men, uh, are heavily criminalized by the state. So these groups and these members need to always be willing to use violence and capable of using violence to protect themselves, to protect their illicit interests, and to protect the space around them, right? And this incentivizes them to control and monopolize violence in the areas where they operate, right? To provide themselves that security. Um, and so my argument has much more to do with the types of threat to that territorial control and that monopoly of violence uh, and that, how that shapes these relationships with these local communities. So I think that there's two primary threats that gangs and other types of criminal organizations can face. And one is a threat from rivals, right? Rival gangs or rival groups. And really, this is the most important threat if you're part of a criminal group. Because if you have a rival that comes into your territory, they're coming in to take it over, right? They're coming in to, to kill you or members of your group. And you need to do whatever you can to defend that territory. So you need to defend your territory at all costs. And this forces them to use a lot more coercion in that area against local residents. And that's the argument that I'm going to make when it, when it comes to rivals. When it comes to police, however, there's a very different set of dynamics. Police 
uh, within all of Latin America, really, have been incapable of dismantling or destroying gang organizations. And in most cases, they're not really even interested in that. They come into these communities, they are looking for gang members to arrest or even possibly kill. They're looking to seize drugs and guns. Or, in a lot of cases, like Rio, they're looking to get bribes from, from an operation, right? They're not looking to conquer the territory, take it over for themselves, and start governing the populations. So this is a very different type of threat. And what I argue is that this incentivizes gangs to actually develop a closer relationship with residents in those areas. And it leads them to provide more social benefits, more parties, resolve more disputes, and provide more types of welfare. Now, I'm going to go into much more detail as to how I arrived at this particular argument, this theory. Um, but I first want to sort of talk you through what the, what the presentation is going to include. So first, I'm going to walk through the field work and the methods in which I engaged while living in Rio de Janeiro. And then I will sort of elaborate a little bit on this governance puzzle that I presented at the beginning. I'm going to conceptualize gang governance and then operationalize it. Then I'll get back into the theory. I'll describe how I arrived at this theory, how I came up with it through ethnographic insights, and then uh, a sort of test, uh, an initial test of this theory, before concluding with some broader implications of what this research means. So uh, first, fieldwork and methods. So my research focuses on the relationships between gangs and favela residents in not, not just one or two of these communities, but all of these communities. There's 1,100 favelas in Rio de Janeiro. Um, originally, the very first favela emerged in the late 19th century, shortly after the abolition of slavery. Um, and it was largely uh, former slaves that were moving into these areas of the city that were unused or were private lands. Most of these were on the sides, steep hillsides surrounding the, the center of the city, which is right over here. Um, and over the course of the 20th century, you had a huge, a massive migration to the city, the industrialized cities in, in Brazil, both Sao Paulo and Rio, and the number of favela residents uh, escalated very quickly, and the number of favelas escalated as well. So today we have about 1,100 favelas throughout the city. Um, that's about uh, 1.5 million residents, or about 25% of the population of the city lives in these communities. And Although they started out as squatter settlements and shanty towns, what they look like today, I hope you can see this photograph, this is a, this is a massive favela, it's called Hosinia, it's on the edge of this mountain. It contains between 80 and 100,000 residents. So it's like a city in and of itself. It is controlled by one drug trafficking gang. This is a much smaller community that's lo located very close to a, to a wealthy neighborhood in the Zona Sul, also controlled by a drug trafficking gang. This is Complexo do Alimão. This is located sort of on the sprawling hillsides that extend from the center of the city out to the edges of the city. Uh, and, a, and a drug trafficking gang also controls this. So what all these places share in common, this is, this is a, a swamp area that was later, uh, this is actually Mare that I'll talk about in a second, that's also controlled by drug trafficking gangs. So what all these places have in common is that drug trafficking gangs really dominate local life in these areas. And I'm going to describe exactly how that works in a minute. So after a couple of preliminary fieldwork trips in 2012 and 2011 to Rio, I moved finally in October of 2012. And very qu quickly, I understood that sort of conventional ways of trying to understand these relationships were not going to work. There's very little crime statistics or data on violence that's reliable within the city. Um, and uh, I, I, I came across a, a couple of methodological issues that I want to talk through first. So favelas in general are low data environments. We have very, we don't know very well how many people live in, exactly live in all of these communities. Um, we don't know levels of crime within them. We don't have very much demographic information about the people who live within them. Uh, even when I moved in 2012, I remember looking at sort of Google Maps. Uh, and the favelas in the city were just these gray zones where nothing was differentiated. There were no streets. There was nothing inside of them. Uh, that has since changed. But 
uh, it's very difficult to try to understand what's happening in favelas from the outside, is, this, uh, is what I'm trying to say. The other thing is that gangs are purposefully clandestine. They're, they're trying to hide their violence. They're trying to hide their different activities so that uh, the public security apparatus and the state doesn't find out about them. So this is another problem trying to study these governing relationships. And then the final one is a problem of access. If, you, if anyone's ever been to Rio, you can't just walk into a favela, right? You need to know someone who takes you in. The gangs, in many cases, are going to stop people who try to come in who don't look like they should belong there. So uh, when I moved to Rio, I had to start making contacts with local NGOs, other researchers who did work in these communities, and I started visiting as many of these communities as, as I possibly could. So, here I have all of the favelas in the city, also in purple. And the ones that I visited over the first six months I lived in Rio are here in orange. I visited about 60 different communities. I'd go in for the day. I'd talk to some NGO workers. I might get a chance to talk to, so, to, to some residents, uh, trying to ask about these different types of relationships. And I understood pretty quickly that Although I, I learned a lot about how gangs relate to the local populations, a lot of the answers that I was getting from people were relatively superficial. It was like they were prepackaged, right? Uh, and so I decided that I was going to have to engage in a different type of methodology, right? Uh, a more ethnographic, uh, a more intimate type of, of research methodology. I also think that there's an epistemological consideration here, right? Um, doing this kind of research, going into the community for just a day or a couple of days, interviewing a couple of people and then writing something up and proposing some policy uh, is something that I've gr grown to become, uh, or I think is ethically dubious, actually. Because the types of information you're getting is usually, po uh, is usually very superficial uh, and it's often quite biased. And so, I, I decided that I, in order to understand the social and political worlds that exist within these communities, I needed, to, I needed to spend a much greater time there. I needed to place myself within these communities. I needed to, to place myself within these governing relationships to try to understand what it meant to live under the authority of, of gangs. Now. Um, so as I said, I, I visited about 60, and I started to make contacts in several of them that I would repeatedly go back to. And one in particular, uh, Complexo da Mare, interested me very much. So I started to go back frequently, um, and I decided to do uh, a much more intensive uh, fieldwork period there. Um, and Mare is a particularly good place to study this because it actually is the only place in the city where there are multiple armed groups that divide the territory between them. There's also been some existing research that's been done on gangs in these communities. There's some powerful NGOs that are present in Mare that have done some research with gang members. So this sort of indicated to me that this type of research was possible. I also got access to these NGOs and developed relationships with them, and they encouraged me to engage in this type of research. In addition, it's a, it's a really important area of the city to understand. Uh, it's located in very close proximity to the international airport. It's also at the confluence of the three major highways within the city. So it's a, it's a focus of a lot of attention within the city. And so it's, I thought it was, it, was a, it was a good choice for those reasons. So this is a, this is a closer up picture of, of Mare. What it is is a, is a contiguous set of 16 separate favela neighborhoods that is comprised of about 140,000 residents. This entire area of the city makes up about one and a half square miles. So there's 140,000 people living in one and a half square miles. That's more densely populated than Manhattan. Uh, so these are very tight communities. Um, and, you know, although the, the drug trafficking gangs and these different armed groups control these areas, there's a lot of economic activity, there's a lot of culture, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's a city within and of itself. And I just want to briefly talk about the different armed groups. So there's one armed group that, that control, one criminal group that controls this area up here in the north of Complexo da Mare. This is a militia or a milicia. And this is um, 
police connected mafia style organization. They really don't engage in very much drug trafficking. They're more interested in, in protection rackets. So they force people to pay them a certain amount each month in exchange for this protection. Um, and then there's three drug trafficking gangs that control this area, these areas of Mare. There are two that are connected to the Commando Vermelho faction. These are prison-based drug trafficking factions. Um, but these are two totally separate organizations, each with their own leadership, each with their own members. They do not overlap whatsoever. The final uh, group is Tercero Commando Puro. And this is a gang that's connected to a different faction. And these two groups are very much rivals. So I moved into the CV2 area. Um, that was my house. I lived on the very top of a house. Um, and as much as a six foot two gringo could, I lived my life like any other restaurant or uh, resident. I ate at local restaurants. I shopped at local supermarkets. I used the same public and informal modes of transportation. I attended local forms of entertainment, religious worship. I spent 24 hours a day seven days a week, 365 days a year in these communities. Um, and so I want to just briefly walk through the different types of methods that I engaged in in the 18 months that I lived in Mare. I did participant observation, so I walked around these communities considerably. I walked through all of the different parts of Mare, so I got to know what sort of what it felt like to be on the, in the different areas. I conducted 175 semi-structured interviews with, and oral histories uh, with residents, current and former gang members, uh, local politicians, uh, workers at NGOs. I also engaged in archival research. The Mare has several libraries uh, that I got access to dissertations and theses written about Mare. I also uh, collected hundreds of newspaper articles from the 1950s to the present about Mare. Um, the other type of methodology in which I engaged while I was there is I, I worked with a local NGO to conduct a couple of sample surveys of residents about the public security situation within Mare. And in the end, we had 1,200 respondents. Also, with a, a couple of research assistants, uh, we built a geolocated gang denunciation database about Mare. So there's a, an anonymous hotline, kind of like Crime Stoppers here, that I got access to that data. And we went through and geolocated all of the different denunciations from 2002 to 2014. And in the end, we had 29,000 separate denunciations from that time period. Now, the talk today, I'm going to focus mostly on the qualitative data. Um, but I'll include a little of the quantitative data as well. If anyone has any questions about any of this at the end, I'm more than happy to talk about it. So the governance puzzle. So I find governance actually to be a particularly useful framework for under understanding how gangs relate to local favela populations. Some scholars have described these relationships as dictatorships, tyrannical, narcocracies, narco-dictatorships, territorial dominance. But I find really that such understandings or such conceptual frameworks uh, elide or ignore the multifaceted and complex relations that exist between residents and gang members. And the, in particular, they sort of avoid thinking about what gangs need from residents and the types of agency that residents have in these relationships. And I define gang governance as the structures and practices through which gangs control territory and manage relations with local populations. And there are two primary dimensions that map very well onto those two photographs that I showed you at the beginning. One is coercion. The gang has, uses some form of coercion to control the territory. And they also engage in some social benefits. And I'm going to walk you through these two dimensions and show you the different types of activities that, that are involved with those types of governance practices. So the first is the monopoly of violence. Um, and that has to do with their geographical presence on the streets in these areas, as well as how much they display their force. Now, I documented these activities as, as I walked around uh, Mare, and I visited various other favelas. And I could see how different gangs, some were much more coercive. Their presence was much heavier on the streets, whereas others uh, were not so much. And I'll, I'll describe a little bit about that. In addition, they place themselves, so how they engage in drug trafficking is th these are open air markets 
So this is what a bokeji fumo looks like, or a mouth of smoke. This is the point, these are the areas where they sell drugs. And what it is is usually just a table with some, some sa plastic sacks on it where you have a few gang members standing around selling these drugs. And the main drugs that they're, they're selling here are going to be marijuana, cocaine, and crack, although they do sell a variety of other substances uh, like inhalants. These are little bottles that people can buy, but those are, are, are less common. So these bokas are often placed throughout the community, so we can look at where those bokas are placed and see how extensive their control is over the territory. They also have security positions that they've placed, and I'll map those out for you a little bit later. Um, so this is one way that they sort of monopolize violence within these communities. The other way is through, and in these two photos, they sort of pretty accurately depict how some gang members look on the streets. They'll have two, I mean, this guy is carrying two semi-automatic weapons. This doesn't actually help you engage in violence. It probably hurts it because you can't shoot these high-powered weapons very accurately with two of them in your hands. But what this is intended to do is to show residents that they are the dominant force within the community. So some gangs will look like this. Others will walk around with just pistols in their shorts. They don't need to demonstrate how much they control the space and the territory. And I'm going to sort of theorize why that is a little bit later. So one is this monopoly of violence, their geographical presence and the display of force. The second is how much they use violence to punish disobedience within these areas. So every gang within the city has implemented a law of silence. And this is to prevent residents from talking to journalists, rivals, or the police. But how much they actually punish people according to this law of silence depends very much within the community. Sometimes the gangs will just threaten people and say, don't do it again or else. They may expel some people from those communities. In other cases, they've been known to torture and execute certain residents. So I wanted to understand if there is a, a, an important difference. In addition, some gangs are engaging in threats, expulsions, cohechivos, which is when they think they need to correct someone's behavior within the community. And that could be just a beating, that could be a, a threatening. Um, as I said, they also engage in torture and executions occasionally. Gangs also differ according to how they monitor residents. So some gangs monitor very closely who is coming into the community, who is coming out. They're monitoring very closely what's happening on the streets. Other gangs are much more laissez-faire. They don't feel like they need to monitor local residents, and they're not monitoring who's coming in and out of the communities. Some gangs have also closed and opened their borders. So some gangs say, there's no one who can come in across this border, and they don't let anyone cross that border in or out. Other gangs don't really care about who's coming in and out of their territories. So I'm trying to understand that difference, right? OK, so the other way that gangs govern is through these social benefits. To some degree, all gangs are going to implement a, a type of social order within these communities. And that is, they have a system of law and justice. If you steal something or someone engages in violence within the community, the gang is, is going to deal with that. But they deal with that in very different ways. Uh, sometimes they're going to arbitrate disputes between people, uh, paying attention or being responsive to what the residents want. In other cases, they're going to do exactly what they want to. They're going to expel people, they're going to torture them, they're going to execute them. Um, in addition, they're engaging in welfare and ec economic stimulation within these communities. Um, they distribute largesse, they provide food and medicine and gas in certain cases. They also, also authorize people to engage in illicit forms of economy uh, and provide employment in, cer in certain cases. So I'm going to show you just a couple of ways that they engage in welfare. This is a Sesta Basica. This is a, a, food, a monthly food basket that some of the gangs provide to the poorest residents within these communities. In these, thing, in these baskets are uh, rice, flour, oil, and a bunch of different non-perishable goods that's, that will feed a family of four or five for up to a month. Um, they'll also provide certain families with gas canisters. In Rio, everyone uses these gas canisters to cook. And the gangs will provide that to those to, to certain families uh, in need. The gangs will also authorize certain uh, shacks or little shops to be put up on the streets themselves. And many people make their living by selling a variety of goods. Here you see fruit and, and vegetables, 
videos and a variety of other types of food uh, and goods that they can sell. And you have to get authorization from the gang to do this directly. In addition, at the Biley Funk parties that I mentioned earlier, the gang will authorize people to set up little shacks where they sell alcohol and uh, food to the party goers. So this is a real, uh, families can make quite a bit of money doing this um, and supplement their income to help their, to help their family survive. So we have social el order, welfare, and we also have these forms of culture and recreation that I referred to at the beginning of the talk. They throw holiday parties, uh, they throw birthday parties in which they, uh, anyone can come to. It's generally free food and drink for residents. Uh, they've also been known to fund soccer teams. So this is one of the Biley Funk parties that I showed earlier. And this is one of the local soccer fields that was helped uh, built by a, a gang. So before I get into the theory itself, I wanted to re reiterate some of these puzzles that I started with at the beginning. So I'm trying to understand why some gangs are much more, more coercive than other gangs, why some gangs provide more benefits to communities than other gangs, and then why maybe they, they change their behavior over time. So this is what I'm going to do in this section. I'm going to first build the theory from ethnographic insights, things that I saw, participant observation that I was doing within these communities. And then I'm going to test this theory uh, against several cases. Um, so first, uh, this again is Mare. As I said, I moved into to Nova Landa. I moved in in June of 2013. And al although I didn't know it at the time, I moved into this area at a relatively pacific moment. There wasn't a lot of inner gang violence going on. Uh, for the first six months or so, there would be just the occasional shot fired across this border between these two rivals. But other than that, there was very little inner gang violence that was going on. These two groups are allies, so there's almost no violence that's ever occurred across this border. Um, but this, sorry, this border right here, this is sort of what it looked like for those first six months. People would be present on that street. You could see kids playing. Even certain shops were open. Then in October of 2013, I was visiting a local NGO called the Lona Cultural. Um, and I was standing at the door with several uh, NGO workers. And we heard a couple of gunshots that came from, from very close. And we all stepped back from the door. Um, and what ended up happening was that this group, the TCP, was mounting a, a huge invasion of their rival's territory to try to take it over. So they came in, in in trucks, and there were dozens of gang members. And very quickly, the the shootout escalated from just a few gunshots to hundreds of gunshots. As CV, the CV members came down and had to defend their territory. So we moved to the back of this building. We all laid on the ground. And we listened to this shootout unfold. Now, over the course of about an hour and a half, although it's very difficult to count because the, the gunshots were so frequent, I would say there were a couple of thousand rounds shot off. There were a couple of dozen grenades that they use. Gangs have access to very high-powered weapons, as well as, in certain cases, grenade launchers. Um, and so we, we stayed there, and we waited till the, the shootout was over. And then we left, and we, we walked around the neighborhood. Um, there was nobody out. and. There was like this very strange smell that hung in the air, I, I assume from the grenades and the, and the gunfire. Um, but this is what the border looks like between these two gangs. There are hundreds of bullet holes in these buildings, um, as often these groups are confronting each other right at this border because they know that they have to defend their territory against these invasions. So this is what, this is what the, the, the border between the two gangs actually looks like. Um, and I noticed that as there were several more invasion attempts over the subsequent weeks, that the behavior of the local gang, the CV2 gang, started to change. So on the one hand, the, the border became much more militarized. They put a lot more of their forces on that border. There were a lot more guys with guns in that area. And the gang members that I talked to, they talked about how the gang leader would come and talk to them about how they needed to make sure that they always had reinforcements, that they always had enough weapons and bullets to defend the territory. 
There was also increased monitoring of the residents, especially anyone who wanted to come across that border. They would question and threaten people often. They would point their guns at them to make sure that they belonged in that territory and that they weren't uh, collaborating with their rival. I also noticed that there was a lot more guns on the street in general. The gang wanted to show people that they were ready for a fight and that they were what they would actually do is there were a lot more motorcycles riding up and down the streets with, with gang members on them as a way to show the community uh, that they were in charge. In addition, they received a lot of foreign reinforcements from other CV2 gangs. This is a form of re reciprocal help that they get from, from these larger factions. Um, and so when I started to think about this, I understood that the gang very much needed to defend their territory at all costs. If they lost, if they allowed that invasion to take place and TCP to come in and take it over, all of the gang members were either going to end up dead or expelled from that territory. The gang will also expel all of the family members and any of the people who had close relationships to that gang, right? Um, and what the gang fears in particular is the residents within their own territory collaborating with their rival and providing them information about where they can come into the community at what times they can do so. And this is why they rely on a lot more coercion to sort of demonstrate their dominance and ensure the loyalty of the local residents. So you might be asking at this point, why instead of using coercion, why wouldn't they just throw more parties and provide more social benefits to the local community. And the reason for that is that it doesn't matter how much the local community loves them. If they lose that territory to their rival gang, that gang will come in and impose their force on the community, right? That gang is essentially dead or gone if they lose that territory. That's how important territorial control is. Now, on the other hand, in the first six months that I lived in this territory, police operations happened quite frequently at least once a week. Now, most of the operations came from this, this police station that's located within this gang's territory right here. It was built in 2003. It doesn't look like what you and I would consider a police station. It looks like a military compound. It has three meter high walls, it has razor wire, it has gun turrets where they can shoot into the community. Um, no resident that I ever interviewed or talked to had said that they had ever been inside of it unless they had been apprehended by the police. And the police don't walk out into the community unless they're engaging in a militarized police operation. But these operations happened relatively frequently. So they'd come from the 22nd Battalion. They'd also, they'd also come in from Avenida Brazil. This is this major highway right here. Um, and I want to show you what these police operations look like. This is a caveron, or a big skull. It's a armored vehicle that can come into these communities, and it, can, it contains about 12 to 15 uh, police officers. And they'll shoot often from these little turret holes. You can see these here. And residents really despise these vehicles because the police can't see very well. And so they're going to shoot at what they think are gang members, but are often not, maybe just young dark-skinned men. Um, and a lot of residents are caught in the crossfire. Um, they also come in with helicopters to prevent the gang members from using the rooftops. And in certain cases, they'll even be shooting into the community from these helicopters. Um, so the feeling of a, of a police operation when you live within the community is, is one of being under siege, right? You've got these helicopters flying very low overhead. And you've got these huge tanks rumbling along the streets. And the gangs, although they have you know, very high-powered weapons, they're not very well trained. And they're not going to stick around to try to confront uh, what is a, a, mili a military-style operation. They're going to hide uh, and wait for the police to leave. And so what they often do is shoot off fireworks so that all of the gang members and all the residents within the territory know that a police operation is happening. And the gang sort of melts into the community. They hide in the homes and businesses of local residents and wait until the police have gone in and maybe found a gang member or two, seized some drugs or guns. Uh, uh, and then they're going to come out when the police leave. Most police operations don't last very long maybe an hour, maybe a couple of hours. 
Uh, and then they're gone, and the gangs are back out on the streets. And what I, what I saw after these operations, or as these operations sort of ramped up, is that obviously, as I said, the gang members are hiding and waiting, and they're in the homes and businesses of local residents and family members. And they needed the help of residents to really avoid enforcement and detection by the police in these circumstances, right? Gang members sought, and so they sought closer and better relations with the local community. Unlike a gang invasion where all of the available members have to run to the border to try to defend it, the gang members just hide and wait. And so this creates a very different type of relationship with the local community. And what I want to do, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So the gangs seek to avoid detection and enforcement. They fear resident denunciation to the police in particular. The, the residents, as I mentioned earlier, can call in anonymously, and the police often use this information to go find particular gang members in the places that they're hiding. So the gang members are very aware of this and actively try to develop closer and better relationships with the local community. And so they offer more social benefits to them. They'll pay for things, they'll provide more welfare, they throw more parties, they offer to resolve a lot more disputes between res residents. So this is the sort of theory uh, in, its, in its totality. And that is, not every, oh, I'm sorry, not every community faces a lot of police enforcement. Some communities face very little, actually. So depending on whether or not they face enforcement, they'll either provide low social benefits or a lot of, high, a lot of social benefits. When they face rivals, uh, they're going to engage in a, a lot of coercion, high coercion down on this uh, axis, and then maybe no coercion or, ver or very low levels of coercion if they don't have any concern that a rival is going to come into their territory. So we have relatively good predictions from the theory about the different types of relationships that gangs should be engaging in depending on their security environment. So now I'm gonna, gonna test this in, in several of the communities in Mare. So I'm gonna look at these three territories in particular. Um, and I'm gonna look first at coercion and then I'm gonna go through so the social benefits these, that each of these gangs is providing. So if we remember in coercion, I'm gonna look at how they monopolize violence within the community, how the, what their presence is like, how much they display their force, whether or not they punish residents, and what their monitoring and the, and the borders look like within each of these territories. So I'm gonna start with CV1. Residents in this territory can't remember uh, a shootout between gangs really ever occurring within the community. They as, have a buffer from their rival down here at the, T the TCP. The TCP will invade this, the CV2 area, but has never tried to invade this area of, uh, of CV1. And there's only a couple of entrances along this border here. All, there's, there's a huge wall that's all along here, and there's no entrances. So the gang really is not that concerned about losing their territory to a rival, right? And as a result, they don't feel these are security positions that the gang has within the community. These are not exact locations. I've changed them slightly uh, just to, to not provide, hopefully not provide any information to, to the police or other groups. And these are the Bocas de Fumo that exist within the community. And what I saw is that this gang uh, relied much less on punishments, much less on threats, much less on violence within the community. They also monitored, oh, sorry. They monitored these borders very little. Uh, people can come in and out. The gang isn't gonna watch you very much coming in and out of these territories. And I argue that this is directly related to how much they feel that threat of a rival coming into their territory. Now let's look at these other two cases. As I said, there's a lot of violence that has been going on actually for the last couple of decades across these, this border as these groups have tried to invade their rival territory and take it over. And as a result, they've sort of expanded their security operations and their, the, the amount of human resources they feel they need. So these gangs are actually much larger than the CV1. And they have, these are all of the CV2 security positions. These are all, I hope you can see this, these are all of the TCP positions. In particular, they have a lot of people stationed along this border to ensure that when, an oper when, a, an, when a rival invasion occurs, that they're going to be able to defend that territory. 
In addition, they've expanded the number of BOCAs so that they can monitor the local population better. They, all three of these gangs make uh, about the same amount of money. It's about a million hay ice a month from drug trafficking. Um, and both of them have relatively the same number of BOCAs. This is some of the data that I talked about from the denunciations. Residents often call in when there's a shootout between the gang members going on. And so we counted the number of these shootouts from 2002 to 2014. As I said, CV1 has very low levels. They have just five over that entire period, although residents couldn't ever remember one actually happening when I interviewed them. Uh, and the, but these two areas have significant levels of violence. So I'm, I'm tying directly how the gang is relating to the local population, how they're monopolizing violence, how they're using punishment in the, in the territory to this type of threat that they face. Now let's talk about social benefits. So just to remind you, we have the different types of social order, the welfare and economic stimulation that the gangs are engaging in, as well as the forms of culture and recreation. What I found within these three territories is that these two CV gangs have, uh, are much more present in the lives of residents than this TCP gang. And I'll, I'll talk you through why, uh, why that is. So in, as I mentioned earlier in 2003, this, the, 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 the state of Rio de Janeiro built the 22nd Police Battalion. So this CV2 gang has faced a lot of police scrutiny over the years. Um, in addition, in 2011, the, the state uh, placed the headquarters of BOPI, and this is an organization, it's a, it's a special elite squad uh, force uh, akin to our, our SWAT teams um, that are in these communities, and uh, they started engaging in significant operations, especially in this Commando Vermelho territory. Now, during this period was the lead-up to the World Cup and the Olympic Games, and BOPI was engaging in frequent operations against Commando Vermelho principally, right? And they did that because Commando Vermelho is the largest and most powerful gang faction, and they focused almost exclusively on Commando Vermelho. So these areas had a lot more police operations in them than this area. Uh, and so I can place these different gangs in these different territories as it relates to how they relate to the local population. So CV1 provided a lot of goods and benefits to the lo to, to local residents. They resolve a lot of disputes. They engage in a lot of welfare. They, um, they have a lot more parties, as does the CV2, but they differ according to how much they face a rival threat. TCP, on the other hand, engages in a lot of coercion, but provides very few social benefits to the local residents. They take a more hands-off approach. They don't resolve that many disputes. They have fewer parties, uh, and they provide less welfare. Now, with the interviews that I did with gang members as well as residents, I could trace sort of over time how these groups have changed as well. And I found that TCP, actually because of the focus on the Commander Vermelio faction ahead of the World Cup and the Olympic Games, faced a lot less scrutiny over time by the police, and therefore, faced very little enforcement over the years that I, that I was present in Mare, um, and therefore provided fewer benefits. CV1, on the other hand, had faced very low levels of police enforcement for many years, maybe because there was no violence going on in that territory. Uh, but as the BOPI arrived, they started ramping up those activities over time. So I just want to summarize, hopefully quite quickly, I've, I've gone a little over, over time. Um, so how and why does gang governance vary is, is the primary question I'm asking. I engaged in long-term and multi-method field work. Then I developed a theory of how gangs govern that focuses on the threats to these organizations and tested this theory across several cases uh, and across time. So the broader implications. First, I want to further test the generalizability of this argument to the rest of Rio de Janeiro. I'm collecting data on gang territories and gang behavior from that anonymous denunciation data set across the entire city of Rio. And I hope to test this theory not just in Mare, but in other locations that don't look the same as Mare. I also think that this theory uh, has the opportunity to travel outside of Rio. My hunch is that 
gangs are engaging in these types of strategic interactions with their rivals and with the public security apparatus, not just in Rio, not just in Brazil, but throughout much of Latin America. So uh, in the book project that I'm working on, I'm working on two sort of external case studies, one in Ciudad Juarez and another in, in Chicago in this country to try to test that generalizability. I think the theory has also implications for a, a couple of different areas. First, as Charles Tilley sort of famously argued, the origins of states lie in very similar different types of organizations, criminal types of organizations. And understanding how contemporary actors, contemporary groups relate to local populations, develop institutions and practices that uh, are intended to manage those relations, I think has implications for how we understand the origins of states. And I also think that this relates to uh, a larger literature on how rebels and different armed groups across the world are governing. What we find in that literature as well is that the local security environment of, the, of those groups matters very much for how they treat local populations. And I think the same thing is going on here. Um, then as far as policy goes, overall, Within Latin America, within most of the world, we've dealt with gangs and urban criminality by increasing the repressiveness of our public security institutions, right? We've tried to use violence to combat, combat these organizations. But what my, my research demonstrates is that by doing so, in fact, we incentivize these groups to develop closer and more collaborative relationships with these local communities, which, which actually makes them harder to combat because they're, they start providing goods and services and institutions that then these residents really come to rely on. So I think that we need to rethink how we're trying to combat these organizations. And what I would say is that we need to supersede these types of governance structures that gangs and other types of criminal organizations are providing by doing that with the state itself and not the more violent arm of the state by combating them with uh, enforcement and violence. Um, so I have uh, several ongoing research projects that are sort of related to this. I can talk about any of these. One of them is when do residents denounce gangs and why? And I'm using that anonymous denunciation data set to do so. I also look at the electoral with a co-author, Juan Albaracin. We're looking at the electoral impacts of gang territorial control within Rio de Janeiro. And we find that gangs limit access uh, during elections to certain politicians. Uh, and therefore reduce the sort of democratic competitiveness of these areas. I was going to do this talk for, or do, talk about the origins of gang governance in Rio de Janeiro for this talk. Uh, this is another project that I have using archival data and oral histories with community members. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm trying to map all of the gang territories in Rio de Janeiro to test the generalizability of the argument. Uh, this, if I know a lot of people were there last night, but we have a photo and a film exhibit about Mare happening in the other Watson building on the second and third floors. Um, and this relates to my experience living in Rio. People would ask me, living in a favela, a lot of non-favela residents would ask me, aren't you afraid to, to live in favelas? Um, and, you know, they believe that these communities are sort of inherently violent. And what I find, in fact, is that actually it depends very much on the community in which you're living, but also there's uh, 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 an important form of order that exists within these communities. And I think combating that sort of sti stigma and prejudice that the general population in Rio and Brazil has for these favela territories is an important sort of public policy uh, effort. Because if we're going to change public policy as it relates to favelas and gangs, we're going to need to convince a huge amount of people who don't live in favelas that that is the correct way to do so. And so my hope is that by educating the population about what favelas are, who lives within them, and the types of culture and social and political practices which exist, we can, we can combat that. So thank you. I'm sorry I went a little over time. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes. Thank you very much for your talk. I'd just like to ask you two questions. First one is your field work. Um, how did you exactly endear yourself to the to the gang members, and 
what allowed you in terms of that code of silence to allow you to make inroads with these individuals as opposed to somebody else? And the second question is, how does someone become a gang member in that area? So what is the procedure? Are all the young men considered to be members of the gang unless they opt not to? Whatever. Thank you for those questions. Um, so how did I endear myself to the gang members? Well, so I moved into Made and I didn't conduct any interviews for about four months. I wanted residents as well as the gang members to feel comfortable with my presence. Obviously, I look quite different than most favela residents. Um, and so I purposely sort of wanted to spend some time in the community to allow people to get comfortable with me. In addition, through the local NGOs, uh, I was able to meet and through uh, research assistance, uh, I was able to meet uh, members of those gangs and asked them if they would be willing to be interviewed. And slowly, I started to make contacts with gang members and I would ask them at the end of an interview if they knew of any other gang members that might be willing to talk to me. Um, and slowly they gave me the names of, of other members who, who would be willing to talk to me. In addition, there's a large number of former gang members that live within these territories. So I interviewed them uh, as well. As far as who's in the gang, there's actually far more young men who want to be in the gang than actually are in the gang. So each of these organizations has between about 100 and 150 members, and the members who join generally do so between the ages of 12 and 15. Um, I didn't interview anyone that young because it, it gets very, I think, and this was part of the IRB process, the ethics process that I went through. Uh, I, I, I decided that interviewing members that young uh, was, was sort of problematic, so I, I refrained from interviewing any, any minors. Well, how do you know they were, they were telling you the truth? And then secondly, it's been my experience, there's no such thing as a former gang member. You know, uh, in my work with gangs, you, you lead the gang when you die. A lot of gang members leave the gang when they die, but there's a lot of others who over, especially as they get older and over time, become very disillusioned with the life of being a gang member. It is, it is not easy. Most gang members usually end up in prison or are dead within two years. So, but, you know, some of the guys who make it to their 20s and have maybe spent significant time in prison have decided that they want to try to leave the gang. And when, in 2014, the military occupied this entire area, this is part of the photo exhibit that I that I organized, um, a lot of gang members actually used that opportunity to try to leave the gang. So some of the NGOs offered classes and, and different services to help them do so. So I wouldn't agree that gang members are, uh, can't, be, can't stop being gang members unless they're dead. You might want to talk to John Hagedorn at University of Illinois, yeah. Chicago campus. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Nick. This is terrific work. Um, thanks for the talk. Now for the fun bit, since you're yeah, preparing right. a job talk after all. Um, so I'm a little skeptical of the lower left corner in your matrix because it seems to assume that the only, um, sorry, so that the only threat by rival gangs comes from like invasions in the way you describe between um, TCP and Command Vermelu 2. Um, but then there's also, I was wondering, like, what about the faction from residents, right? So if, um, uh, if a rival gang can win over territory by kind of wooing over residents, mm -hmm. um, then they would be incentivized to provide high social benefits, right? So this sound, this seemed to assume that the only rival threat comes from this kind of very... External. Yeah, external and open kind of advances from your rivals. Um, so that's number one. Number two, I'm worried that uh, police enforcement is endogenous to many other things in that matrix, um, amongst other rival competition, but also within it. Like so, the coercion that they're deploying and the violence that they're deploying. And then when you brought in the analysis of how the um, cases changed over time, I was like, oh, cool, he's gonna like address this. But then you actually mentioned that. Um, CV1 had an increase in violence and that this kind of brought more police enforcement. So that actually kind of reinforced my concern of endogeneity there. And third, and this is kind of the nasty question that you might have already gotten or might get in the job talk, but 
How is this different from Martin Sanchez Jankowski um, Islands in the Street book from 1991? So in particular, he also talks about how turf wars will lead to more violence in the neighborhoods, um, how um, the, the gangs need to provide social benefits to prevent um, threat and defections from local residents, also to recruit future gang members. And also in terms of your policy implications, it sounded very similar in terms of saying these gangs establish a kind of symbiotic relationship with the community that in the long run makes it more difficult for, um, for the, the state to, to, to win back control in the neighborhood. So yeah, those would be my question, but thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so first, uh, resident defection. So the gangs actually try to, when they, when they engage in these invasions, if they make any headway into the territory, they'll often tell residents that they're going to treat them better than the, than the gang that they already have. The problem is that when they come into those territories, they're shooting into the community, right? So a lot of residents are being shot at by the rival coming in, and a lot of residents are actually killed by the rival coming in. So that argument that they're going to be treated better isn't trusted by most of the residents within that territory. And the gang has a lot of, I mean, in most cases, I would say residents prefer the gang that they have to a gang that they don't know how they're going to treat them. And none of those guys are from this neighborhood, whereas a lot of these gang members are from this neighborhood. They grew up there. They have better relations. So I would say that defection is not really a, a problem um, for the gang. What they're, what they're concerned about, though, is that residents may occasionally tell them, tell their rival that of what's going on in the in the territory, not necessarily their uh, allegiance to them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, as far as the endogeneity, I think you're right. In a community with really high levels of violence between the gangs, it's obviously going to face a lot more police enforcement. So if you're if you're in this territory, it's very likely that you're going to be moving over into this territory. However, even between the two gangs that I showed you, the TCP and the CV2, even though they were engaging in a lot of viol violence between them, the police enforcement really focused on the Commander Vermelio side, right? So I think that we can't actually differentiate between those two sides of the... So that's of, something you could leverage as an identification strategy. Right. <laughs> and the other thing is on the CV1 that you mentioned, like the sort of violence increased, actually violence increased very little within the CV1 territory. It was just that BOPI came in, right, the SWAT group, and just started policing much more. The, the, the amount of violence in the territory didn't increase at all. And then as far as, you know, Martin Sanchez Jankowski's book, which is wonderful, I think actually my work um, has a lot to say about the American gang literature. Unfortunately, we haven't had that much interaction or conversation between those two bodies of work. People who work in Latin America, study gangs and other types of criminal organizations, study them in a very particular way. And uh, people who study American gangs just focus on the United States and very seldom focus outside of the United States. So one of my hopes is that I can incorporate or bring those two, those two literatures into conversation. So I don't think that I would differ so much from Sanchez Jankowski's work, but I would, I would definitely add to it. Compliment it. Yeah, Emily. Um, can you, what explains the stability and persistence of the border peace agreement between CV1 and CV2, and why is it that there's no incentive for CV2 and TCP to um, either merge or to kind of stabilize that border in, in a similar way? That's a very good question. So. Between CV1 and CV2, there's a, as I mentioned, there's a sort of larger drug trafficking faction, and the leadership within that faction is the one that generally resolves disputes between gangs of the same faction. So if CV1 and CV2 ever had a problem, they would have to deal with the leadership of the larger faction. And what this means is they would gain less access to drugs. So that's the, the tool the sort of stick that the, that the faction has to make sure that not everybody starts fighting amongst themselves. The second, when it comes to TCP and CV2, there was actually a few years ago, they tried to have a sort of alliance. They tried to come to a sort of peace agreement. It lasted about three days before one of the groups decided to invade. And, you know, I, I think that in general, 
between the rival factions especially, it's very difficult for them to come to peace agreements because those larger factions also are incentivizing them to fight each other because they don't want that sort of local level alliance to hurt the power of the larger faction. So I haven't gotten in in this to too much of those like larger details I do in the book project, but I focus much more in this presentation on the micro dynamics on the ground. Yeah, David. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Nick. I, I think this is a really fascinating project. Uh, so I have sort of just three um, non-original uh, research questions that people bring up and stuff like this. And one is about the two by two. And I think the endogeneity concern is a great point, and you should listen to sort of the identification idea. One way to push back against it is to have some theory about which of the two things happens in general. Mm -hmm. So if you just had some general intuition about when there is or isn't enforcement or is or isn't rivalry, not tested, but just some anecdotal evidence to support those, mm -hmm. I think that will help. I think people will ask, and I think it'll help you to push back against the endogeneity issue. You also sort of sold Marais as being a very unique place, the only place like it. Well, then who cares what happens there? So if all of the hundreds or thousands of other favelas don't have this unique location and um, rival groups all tucked in there, then you're sort of diminishing how important it is what you're finding there. So why should we care about this? Uh, and then finally, um, it seems very unusual to use the same set of cases to both generate theory and to test the theory. And I know that you're going to go on and test these other locations, but you're sort of promising me that but you're not really delivering at this moment. So how can you make me feel better about uh, sort of dipping into the same pool twice? Uh, that's a good, yeah. Um, so maybe the last question first. So I think that the theory, I the theory that I developed, I developed in the, the Nova Landa territory, the CB2 territory, right? And then over time, I got access to those other gangs. But initially, I was just developing within that one area. So there's a sort of temporal dynamic to the testing that I think I didn't necessarily talk about. Um, but I, you know, I, I sort of developed it within that CV2 area. And then I thought to myself, if I can get access to these two other gangs, I can sort of test and see if this theory actually works. And I found that it overall did. So I think you're right that I'm testing with all within, all within one area. The problem with testing, especially in the Rio de Janeiro case, is one of access, as I said. Trying to test this effectively, you have to live in the community. You have to, and that's not an easy thing. I mean, I could go back and do another 18 months in another set of cases, but that was, you know, that's a little bit too much. So, you know, I'm hoping to test it more systematically across a greater number of cases, but I think the temporal aspect, in addition, looking over the histories of the gangs, I can sort of tease out some of those causal mechanisms over time that just a, a snapshot wouldn't necessarily do. I'm sorry, what was the, what was the, uh, the other question? Um, Mara is the only oh, right. Like a so it is, it is a sort of unique place. There are, it's the only set of favelas where the, the territories are contiguous. However, there are other favelas in the city that are very closely located to one another, and they face also very high levels of violence. So it, it has a lot in common with other places within the city. In addition, I think it's the, maybe the most important set of favelas in the city to understand because of its strategic importance. It was so important, in fact, that the Brazilian government placed 2,500 military soldiers there for the duration of the World Cup and the Olympic Games and was just willing to put community policing in all of the other favelas, right? So I think that it has an importance that goes beyond maybe just the theory, but an importance for the city uh, and an importance for the Brazilian government. They're willing to put their military on the streets. Anna. Hi. So you talked about the use of um, repressive force by, like when you were mapping it, you were looking at the gangs and their use of repressive force versus social benefits. And with the state, you were also mapping the repressive forces of the police in Balpi, the battalion in Balpi to the north. But we didn't talk at all about um, the state benefits, right? Because essentially the state is also, in theory, monopolizing the means of violence and providing benefits. And I was just wondering within Mare, I know there's been a lot of school construction. I know there's a lot of, um, you know, change in terms of when healthcare workers will and won't go in, et cetera. And I guess I was wondering if that was another layer that Imagine. would affect the way gangs behave with respect to providing services versus using coercion. 
Yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean, Made has been, the state has taken a greater role in providing some health and some education within Made, but it's, it's still woefully underfunded within those territories. And I don't think that the state has really made attempts to provide dispute resolution, provide the types of governance that the residents in these communities actually need. So the police don't provide any sort of services to those communities. They only have that repressive relationship. No resident that I had ever talked to had ever gone to the police when they wanted to deal with domestic violence, sexual abuse, crime fighting, any of that. They generally go to the gangs if they're going to go to anyone. And so I think that the ty it's about the types of governance. Sure, the gangs are never going to build schools. They're never going to build health posts. But they're providing a lot of the, the, the necessary governance that residents are actually in need of in the community. Does that? That makes sense. I guess I'm just questioning a little bit whether or not it's an important dynamic to, in theory, if you were talking about in terms of policy changes, essentially if the state wants to win the loyalty back of the local residents, they need to come in and provide more services and essentially they want to be the people that residents turn to as opposed to the gang members, not only in dispute right. resolution and generally, again, where they would monopolize resources would be in things like education and healthcare so, and infrastructure and that sort of thing. So I just wanted to... Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, it's, I think it's a valid point, but I think it's about the types of governance and the types of services that they would be for providing. And I was particularly focusing on those types of daily sort of mundane governance that needs to happen within these communities if you want to effectively combat gangs. Just building schools, just building ho health posts, as we've seen across the entire city, is not an effective way to def deal with the gangs. So I think it's a, a different type of of governance, of monopolization of resources, if you will. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to return to Emily's question about consolidation and maybe frame it a little bit more generally, because apart from uh, the borderlands between C1 and C2, I actually think that the incentives for uh, gang consolidation merging is and is a big challenge for your hypothesis to overcome if, if the primary impetus for coercion is from competition from other gangs, then both gang members and decision makers therein, as well as civilians, have a vested interest in consolidating gangs into larger organizational units. So, I mean, my, my general question would be, what's your um, default model for the equilibrium number of these gangs and what are the conditional factors that shape that equilibrium and then related to that would be why is why is gang territory so geographically uh, shaped in this environment whereas in other examples you can imagine yes there are neighborhoods that are dominated by particular gangs but the abilities of those gangs to sell or conduct business outside of their territories are more fluid or overlapping Yet here it seems like these territories are rigid, that, the, that contestability is a formal invasion across a borderline. borderline. Yeah. And I think that if you had some uh, amount of time and or slides dedicated to uh, constructing some sort of industrial organizational model of, of gang size and quantity, um, it would help um, highlight what it is that, that your theory is necessarily explaining. Yeah. So. Maybe on the last question first. Um, so I've actually mapped the gang territories within this area from the very beginning of the gangs. And originally they started out as just small groups of men, uh, teenagers and men in their 20s, selling marijuana first, but then cocaine later. And there was a consolidation period that did occur, right? So th in fact, uh, in the 1970s, what that CV2 territory looked like was there was 10 different gangs that had small little territories within it. And they began to engage in warfare among themselves and take over their rivals' territory to eventually get to a place where they could consolidate territorial control over a large area. There was a period when more of Mare, they tried to expand, they tried to take over more territory, but it's often the case that the, the police, in many cases, will prevent like one huge gang from taking over massive amounts of territory within the city by imprisoning or killing the leadership. So that sort of prevents this larger consolidation that you're talking about. 
Um, in addition, I think, you know, Mare has a bunch of different communities within it. Um, but if you look at the rest of the city, you'll often find favelas are sort of isolated. They're little islands. And to consolidate control across numerous little islands is very difficult for people who have no idea where that other gang comes from or where those other gang members come from. So I think that that, that prevents. And this relates to the question about the territories themselves. All gang territories within the city are coterminous with the favela territory, with the favela borders. And this is a historical artifact from uh, a lack of property rights, the behavior of the public security apparatus in dealing with where the favela ends and where the city proper actually begins. So, I mean, it's an, I think it's an interesting case because it's very difficult to move those borders at all. They're, rel they're very stable over time, especially as they relate to you know, what they call the asphalt or the, the, the regularized, more formalized city. Yeah, over here. Hopefully this will be quick, but when, okay. when you say uh, the monopoly on the use of violence, I can't help but add legitimacy to the beginning of that phrase, right, going back to Weber. Um, and it seems like your, sort of, your mode of data collection would lend itself well to be able to speak to the issue of legitimacy. And I was kind of surprised, especially with social benefits and providing order, uh, what you observed sort of on the ground with residents of Mare and their attitudes towards the gangs that are ruling over them? That's a great question. Um, so I don't like the use of legitimacy in that definition of the state or even of these gangs because I think it totally depends on who you are within the community. So even within these favelas, right, there's a lot of people who really don't like the gangs and they often call in on the police against them because they've abused maybe their children, sold them drugs. So there is a division within the community as well as to how actually legitimate the gangs are. Other people who have a much closer relationship with the gangs, they have been offered employment, they have family members in the gang, they're going to view the gang as a much more legitimate entity within the community. So I think that's very much up for grabs within the community. And some of my other work tries to look at that, tries to understand how certain people are willing to denounce the gangs, other people are willing to very much work with them or join them or, or receive benefits from them. Thank Thanks. you for the question. So I want to thank you, Nate, for Thank you. Thank you.